UFC St. Louis just recently wrapped up, and I am going to recap the entire card. I'll start with the first fight of the night and then work my way to the main event. So make sure you guys smash the like button. And if you're new, subscribe. We're going to start things right off. First fight of the night. The ladies went after it was Veronica Hardy versus JJ Aldridge. Veronica Hardy did enough to get the win, even though she dealt with some adversity in that last round. Still had done enough in the first two. Pulls off a decision. Definitely has shown consistent improvement as a pro. Only 28 and I think has a decent ceiling in the game. But like I'm telling you right now, if I'm Dan Hardy, I'm talking to Veronica about trimming the body weight down. Get her to 115. She looks significantly smaller than JJ. Now, when I say significant, I'm not talking about a middleweight versus a heavyweight type look. But for the weight class, I think she is a little bit on the smaller side, at least with her stature. Not the shortest girl at 5'4", but much more of a frame, I think, for a 115-pound girl. So if you can cut that weight, maybe she can actually make a legit run. If she's going to be staying at 25, I think she is going to run into some trouble as she moves up the ranks. Only 28 years of age, so the potential is endless here. I think smart move, Hardy, 115. And let's see her try to break into the top 15. First fight of the night, ladies went hard for it. Decent fight. Aldridge didn't look horrible either, but speed advantage was clear for the side of Hardy. Let's keep running our next fight on the card. Charles Johnson versus Jake Hadley. Charles Johnson did his thing. He deserved the win at the end of it. He outstruck Jake Hadley. He touched him up from the outside. He looked smooth with it for most of it. Failed takedown attempts were like a major story of this fight for Jake Hadley. He was consistently shooting, and Johnson's defense was on point. I got to tell you, man, Charles Johnson looks very primed right now. I've seen him get better over the recent years. He's been in the UFC for a long time now and just clearly outworked Jake Hadley and touched him up from the outside. Charles Johnson had excellent boxing in this fight, and he put on a magnificent performance, and he deserved the win at the end of it. I think Charles Johnson could still do some interesting things at flyweight. He has a good style. He's quick. He's got good kickboxing. He's got great takedown defense. I don't know about rankings-wise, but he's a hard out for anybody in that flyweight division. He talks about he says he's the best five-round fighter in the world. Unfortunately, man, he's going to have to make a run up the ranks with these three-round fights because he's not getting the main event after beating Jake Hadley. They're not doing that. They're not doing that. But listen, Charles Johnson, nonetheless, good performance, tough vet. At 125, and normally as an underdog, a pretty damn good bet if he's not taking on a tremendous grappler. So good performance by him. Let's keep running. Next fight. Our next fight of the night, Trey Waters, Billy Goff. This fight made me sad. I won't lie to you. I had Billy Goff as the dog in this one. He was the dog lock for the week. And I personally thought it was a fight that could have ended up going either way. They gave it to the side of Trey Waters, which I understand because there were some decent straight shots and he was touching them from the outside. But Goff also had tremendous pressure throughout the whole thing. I thought it looked a lot more like a 29-28 split decision than what the scorecards were. Two judges went 29-28, and I can't really get all up in arms about it. It's a close fight. In the moment, I was having a fucking meltdown. But the fact that someone scored a 30-27 is crazy to me. I really thought, like, at worst, you're giving Billy one round. He could potentially have won, too. Like, I think Billy Goff could have won this decision. I personally scored the fight for him at the end of it. Now, I haven't gone back and rewatched it. And I haven't gone back now rewatching it without the emotions of, you know, being on the Billy Goff side. But still, in my mind, how it all went down, it was Billy Goff doing his thing. In a competitive fight, though. Competitive fashion, for sure. I'm not saying it was a washout. Not saying it was a wipeout. I thought Goff brought tremendous pressure. He ate some massive shots. He was in Trey Waters' face the whole time. And he had an unrelentless fucking break. Like, holy shit. You push him to the edge, he's not falling off the cliff. So I do like Billy Goff moving forward. As far as underdogs go, I honestly think he's a valuable dog to look out in fights moving forward. Because he has no break in him. And arguably, he won this fight for me. I think so. And a lot of people agree with me. Let me know in the comments if you agree. I know there's going to be probably a split, but like I want to hear what the people are thinking. Are some of you guys agreeing or are some of you guys thinking no? Because I think a lot of you will think yes. I think Billy Goff's pressure was great. He landed some big shots here. He was in Trey Waters' face the whole time. 
Trey Waters squeaks out a competitive decision, but you know what I like about Trey Waters? In the Charlie Arnold, like, way post-fight interview after the event, I guess it's the post-event interview, he even said himself, like, he really wasn't sure at the end of it if he'd done enough, but thankfully, you know, he ended up getting it. So even him unsure himself, that shows it was a damn competitive fight, and he was the one in there. I think Billy Goff could have got the decision, but I'm not going to go up in arms and cry about Trey Waters taking a split. The fact that it was a unanimous and there was a 30-27 is fucking atrocious to me, man. That's atrocious. The 30-27 is going to drive me to fucking rage. Billy Goff, I thought, slightly did enough. I give him 29-28. But instead, it goes Trey Waters and somebody throws a 30-27. That's crazy. I can't keep ranting and raving about it. Trey Waters is nice from the outside. Billy Goff is nice with the pressure. I look forward to more with both guys, and I like both their games, man. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card. The ladies went after it. Tabitha Ritchie versus Tisha Pennington. I thought Tisha Pennington won the fight. At the end of it, I thought it was 29-28 Pennington. I thought she brought some good boxing, hit Richie with some nice punches. I thought it was two rounds to one. The first two for Tisha, the third for Richie. Tabitha Richie did some control work in the clinch, but no substantial dominance moments. She ended up getting a split decision. Split decision made sense, but I thought Tisha did more damage. And I picked Richie to win, but I said it all week. She's a concerning call and ended up being mad close. Over two and a half ended up being beautiful here, but it was a disgusting wide line. I just think, truth to be told, Tisha Pennington could have easily got the decision. I thought she had more significant moments. She landed some big strikes on the feet. Her boxing looked good. Having a baby and coming back, she looked great. Tisha should definitely not retire. I'd like to see her fight more. Because though the decision went against her, the fight, to me, went her way. And regardless of the outcome at the end, it shows she can still compete with a lot of these girls in that top 15. And I think Tisha Pennington is a hard matchup for a ton of prospects a ton of contenders alike, and she's still, I think, a potential good bet in the future. Now on a two-fight losing streak, she might get overlooked again, and maybe she can put together some magic later uh, this year and get a W. We'll see when she comes back, but I do think Tisha put it on. I thought she deserved the win at the end of it, but they gave it to the prospect, Tabitha Richie, who's on the come up. Close enough fight. I scored it against her. My card was Pennington 29-28, but Tabitha Richie gets it on the judge's decision. Split decision win. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, Esteban Rebovix, Terrence McKinney. Holy shit. Esteban Rebovix essentially ended Terrence McKinney's career. That's really all it was. And I don't know how this didn't get a performance of the night bonus. This doesn't have a performance of the night bonus. Like, the UFC's not giving it one. Esteban Rebovic should be getting at least 20K on the side. He got a vicious high kick knockout of Terrence McKinney in 37 seconds. Shit, man. Shit. The way McKinney went out was brutal against the cage. Like, he just took a seat. Like, he was exhausted on the fucking playground, and he sat against the wall. But instead, it was a kick to the face that sat him there. My God, Rebovic hit him with the perfect shot. And my God, the fall from grace by Terrence McKinney... Some of the worst I've ever seen. Some of the worst I've ever seen. I'll tell you something, though. Esteban Rebovic's really made uh, Ismael Bonefim's win look kind of mid now. Because, you know, when Bonefim laid out McKinney with the flying knee, it was like, holy fuck. But now if the Rebovic's did this, it's like, that knee's nothing compared to that head kick. Good win for Rebovic's, man. 28. I still don't know if I believe in him. He landed a head kick, but I still don't feel like he's super elite. I mean, last time, Kemi Kirk gave him trouble. Maybe he's gotten better. Maybe I'm overlooking him. Maybe I'm bitter that he beat my guy, Terrence McKinney. You know what? Fuck it. Maybe I am. I'm pissed off. I'm pissed that he beat T-Rex. But it's all right. It's how the game goes. I think that Terrence McKinney, unfortunately, sent back to the bottom of the ranks. But he's not getting cut, though. Because he's still, what, 2-1 and one in his last three? Forgivable. He'll be back again. But unfortunately, he looked horrible. He got killed. He got killed. Knock out of the fucking night. Next fight on the card was our featured prelim of the night. Holy shit. Our featured prelim of the night. And there's a lot to say about this featured prelim. <laughs> Let's start it off with the fact of all facts. Nobody on the planet 
would have predicted Chase Hooper to drop Slava Claus. Okay? No one. Zero percent of people. I don't buy it. And if you're saying after the fact you predicted it, you're a liar. If you have some video evidence that was shown proof of date of recording to know it was from before, then man, you got a fucking crystal ball. Congratulations. Chase Hooper dropped Slava with a looping overhand in the first round. At that point, we should have known the fight was done because Slava getting rocked on the feet, his confidence is gone. He got destroyed on the ground and then survives to go on to the second round and gets taken down right away. Chase Hooper did his thing with the grappling, beat the shit out of Slava and destroyed his face. He had like fucking baseball-sized hematoma. And then he gets Slava in a submission. I don't want to misquote the sub. I think it was a Darce. Yes, it was a Darce choke. And Slava actually doesn't tap. He's like reaching for the hip, but it looked very much like a tap. Ref jumps in, stops the fight. You know, it is what it is. It's how the game goes. It's unfortunate, but it's how the game goes sometimes. But truth to be told, holy shit, they could have stopped that fight earlier with ground and pound. The submission didn't even need to happen. Keith Peterson was not no nonsense. He was fucking no life left. Like, you better be lifeless when they're stopping the damn fight. This was a huge win for Chase Hooper, who's really evolving as a pro. I got to say, respect to Chase Hooper. His game's coming together. His striking's gotten better. He's gotten more muscle on his frame. His grappling's solid. I like Chase Hooper. I give him a hard time. But Chase Hooper, if you're watching, I apologize for absolutely roasting you on my last show, The Way Intro. You should still watch it, Chase. You'll get a laugh out of it, too, because I think you'll agree with me. Uh, but yeah, man, you did great. Respect to Chase Hooper, man. I think that his jits look sick. His striking looks better than ever. I think he's tricky for a lot of guys to deal with now. If he can eat a punch, shit. Chase Hooper's a different animal. 55 Chase Hooper is very different than 45 Chase Hooper. Good performance. Go win. And uh, Slava Claus, I'm sorry, my man. It's time to close up shop. Slava Claus, I don't know, man. If the rate he's going, he's going to be fighting in the LFA. Let's jump on to the main card. Oh, shit. Main card opener. If you guys haven't, smash the likes. If you're new, subscribe. I'm taking a sip of my drink and let's start it off. It was Waldo Cortez Acosta, Rebellis to Spain. Rebellis to Spain. Oh, my God. Exposed. Beyond belief, please, just erase this picture. I, I'm, I don't even want to see it. Like, I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted looking at it. I wish I had something I could block his faith with right now. Like, I can't. I can't even deal with this, bro. I can't deal with this shit. He got absolutely exposed. It was terrible. Exposed. Exposed more than... Holy shit. Anybody's getting exposed. It looks like he has zero jujitsu training. Okay, absolutely none. And I think, truth to be told about it all, he doesn't grapple. I don't think he does grappling. Tell me, chat, if, if chat, I'm talking to chat like I'm on a live stream. I feel like I'm live still. In the comments, my people, do you think that this guy trains at all, the grappling? I don't think so. This is what I'd put on him. I don't have a PNG of it, but you know what? This will fucking do, all right? The dunce hat, right there. Dunce hat in him, Okay. That's what is deserved from this fucking performance. The fucking dunce hat. He doesn't train grappling. He looked like below a white belt. Looked like he'd never done jujitsu. I don't, I don't get it. You're in the UFC. You might as well at least be working your ground skills. Waldo is not a wrestler. Waldo was a pro boxer and a baseball player. And he's dominating the fight on the floor. For Bellis to Spain, bust of the fucking decade, Okay. Because the hype was unreal. The look is unreal. He's got the blonde hair. He's long, tall, 6'7", freak. And then that performance? Bro, I don't know if he's beating Austin Lane at this point. So maybe that's the fight to make. Good win for Waldo, though. He gave him a veteran lesson. More than double the fights. He pulled it off. And I have, I don't know. I believed in the prospect. I fell into the UFC narrative, dog. I fell into the trap. He got exposed more than anybody's been exposed all year. My God. It wasn't like Waldo just caught him with a big punch or caught him in a guillotine or like grabbed his back early. No, no, no. Rebellus to Spain showed us every skill set that he has on the ground. And you know what that is? None. I didn't see one skill. I didn't see one skill, bro. There's no grappling skill. Zero. It's horrible. It's the worst grappling I've ever seen. 
Like, this is two, not even 2000s grappling. 93 grappling, bro. This is 1993 grappling. This is before jiu-jitsu was a thing in America grappling. That's what Rebellus to Spain is doing. Waldo, you look good. Good performance for Waldo. Go in. I am pissed off because I've been a believer in Waldo for every one of his fights prior to this one. And then I said, yeah, I'm going to jump on the Spain train and fuck. I crashed into the wall like a moron. So, yeah, I deserve this loss here. It is what it is. Waldo, good performance, man. Good dog. Fucking to Spain. Done. Done Spain, bro. He's out. He's out. I don't know who his coaches are. He's over MMA Temple. I don't know where it is. Go train with some wrestlers, bro. That's all he should be doing. Jiu-jitsu and wrestling. The stand-up's fine. But he did square off awkwardly in the stand-up, too. So, I don't know. He might just be a complete bust altogether. Taekwondo is not normally a great base for MMA. And proven once again. Next fight. Sean Woodson, Alex Caceres. Close fight. But Woodson, I thought, did enough, dude. I was... Honestly, happy for Sean Woodson to flow as well as he did in the stand-up because Saris was in his face. Woodson just landed a bit more of like the significant, like real clean, thudding shots. But Caceres was in the fight. He was very game. He was very game. I'll tell you this, too. I think that Sean Woodson has a really difficult frame to deal with at 145 pounds for a lot of these guys. I mean, 6'2", 78-inch reach. If you dig in and you're like, yo, who could he potentially fight next? Coming into this, he was number 22. Now he's got to be towards 15. I just want to see. In that top 15, like, Joe Anderson, Brito, and him, that's a weird matchup I'm kind of interested in. He called out Bryce Mitchell. That's a great call out. There are some great options for Sean Woodson, man. I really think so. I think he has some great options next. I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at here. Good performance by him. Caceres still was tough as always. Very game till the very end. They were mixing it up till the final bell. But uh, Sean Woodson just a bit better, a little faster, a bit longer, younger, more primed. And I'm excited to see what Sean Woodson can do. I mean, he's got a crazy frame. I don't know about world title, but he's saying he wants number 10, then number 5. Him and Bryce Mitchell's an interesting one, though. Because I think he probably stops Bryce Mitchell's takedowns. You know Bryce Mitchell can't box. And Sean Woodson's a good boxer. So... There is a path that Sean Woodson breaks into the top 10, and I'm very curious to see if that ends up coming to fruition. So, Team Sean Woodson right here. Next fight on the card, upset of the night. Diego Ferreira exposes Mataj Rebeski. The first round, Rebeski rocked him. He hit him with big shots, but like the big, bulky bodybuilders in fighting do, the muscles is too much, man. The muscles is too much. Mataj Rebeski is too fucking jacked for his own good. Diego Ferreira, second, third round, beat the shit out of him and ends up stopping him. I honestly thought the fight could have been stopped a lot earlier in the third round. Keith Peterson, I believe, was the ref of this one. It's like if he dies, he dies mentality with him now. I don't know what the fuck's going on. He let Rambeshki get beat to fuck. His eyes were both shut. Like, it was a brutal beating. Diego Ferreira looked really good. I don't understand. These Brazilians, somehow, they go from, like, Jose Aldo and him now. They get older, they get better. USADA's gone, they get better. Now, I'm not saying Diego Ferreira's on juice or anything. I'm just, I'm just saying, man. I'm just saying it's an interesting thing to notice, okay? It's an interesting thing to notice. At 39, Diego looks better than he's looked in a long time. Faster than he's looked in a long time. Now, is it that Mataj Rezbeski got exposed by an experienced vet? Probably. Because the jiu-jitsu skill of Diego Ferreira, you can take all the steroids you want. They're not going to give you jiu-jitsu skills. It's just something about the rebirth of him. Like, he looks like he's still got it. I think Diego Ferreira is a hard matchup for a lot of guys. Him and Patty Pimblett would be really interesting. I know Pimblett's on to bigger fights, but still, like, just a, a, an imagination-type matchup. Rebeski was supposed to be the next guy in the come-up. He was supposed to be repping Poland heavy. No. 17-fight win streak over after uh, Diego Ferreira whooped him. I think Rebeski maybe needs to lose some muscle, man. Shrink down to a 45-pound frame because 66-inch reach... Five foot seven, bro. He gave up eight inches in reach with just two inches of height. That's crazy. He's got the wingspan of a flyweight. Not even, though. The flyweights are longer than him. Diego Ferrer looked really nice, man. Great performance by him. He got dropped in the first round and hit with some bombs, but his chin held up. And he beat Raveshki bad. Brutal beating. Good performance by Diego, man. He deserved the performance of the night bonus for that because it was not expected to happen. Huge underdog win. 
Next fight on the card, Carlos Alberg, Alonzo Menafield. Um, we'll call this one the head scratcher of the night because the game plan of Menafield was crazy. I know Alberg said he expected Menafield to come crazy at him, but like, why? Why would he? Why would Menafield blitz a high level kickboxer like that? Like a chaotic swings. He hit him a little bit with a straight, and then he just kept going after him with wild shots and then get drop rock, knocked out in the first 12 seconds. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Let the fight marinate. Even if you're getting chopped up, all right, take some reads. Like, take a second to blitz him like that. It's one thing if you hit him super clean and followed up, but, like, he just threw reckless shots. He threw caution to the wind, reckless abandon, wide, wild punches, and, of course, you're going to get laid out by a technical striker with knockout power like Olberg doing that. Crazy game plan from Menafield. I don't understand. I thought he was better than that. Guess not. Guess not. That game plan was crazy. Oberg's nasty, man. Oberg's hype is going through the roof, too. I mean, he's emerged as a contender in that top 10, top 15. I think now big fights are kind of on the horizon for him. I'm very interested to see him mix it up with some of the better guys in the world. I know Anthony Smith, Bogdan Gushkov is probably next, but like, and Anthony Smith comes to mind when I think of the level of where Alberg's at at the moment. He definitely could get a name. Somebody with some not notoriety. He's working his way up well. Great performance, man. Alberg, I mean, he needed 12 seconds. It was a great performance for as quick as the fight went down. Congratulations to him. Menafield put the chin out there and gave it to him, and Alberg absolutely took it. So, great slick striking. All right, let's keep running. Next fight on the card was our co-main event of the evening. Listen, I am very happy with this one. Buckley put it on Rizzy Boyov, and he almost got him out of there in the third round. I called third round finish or a decision for Buckley, and it absolutely came to fruition. I'm very happy with my pick here. During uh, some of the shows earlier in the week, I said Rizzy Boyov is going to be the fraud of the night, not meaning that he's a horrible fighter or anything. But he's got flaws in his game, and he was like the people's underdog all week. Everybody wanted him. Rizzy Boyev was 62% of the people's picks. He was at plus money, and they all attacked it. But I stood strong with my Numansa Buckley pick. And my guy, Numansa Buckley, almost called him uh, Muckley, Bubba Buckley, Bubba from Forrest Gump, Bubba Gump Buckley, put it on. Landed some key takedowns in the fight. Landed some good punches on the feet. Outworked Rizzy Boyev, avoided the big shots from him, hit him with some bombs, rocked him bad in the third round, and beat the hell out of him. The ref could have jumped in and stopped it, but they didn't. It was uh, if he dies, he dies type of night. I thought the third round finish was so live. Ends up going distance, but definitely Buckley, the clear winner at home in St. Louis. And then after the fight, he calls out Conor McGregor, which is like kind of an outlandish call out. And he even said in the uh, like follow up post event interview that he kind of recognizes that, but he had to mention McGregor to you know get some excitement flowing. I respect his mentality. Nasultan Rizzi Boyov is decent, but he's got horrible takedown defense, and you know he can't deal with the pop of Buckley. Buckley's that guy. Buckley's emerged now as a contender. Gilbert Burns is a more sensible name. That's a really interesting stylistic clash too. I think that's a high possibility for what's next. How great has Buckley's come up? And he's been in the UFC a long time, and he has now finally found some elite footing. Beat Luke, who was ranked. Beat Rizzy Boyev, who was a terrifying prospect on the come up. And now retains his, you know, 11 rank. And he's probably going to fight somebody ahead of him. After taking, a, you know, onto somebody on short notice, who wasn't even close to rank. He was fighting up at middleweight, then cut down. Great win for Buckley. Great performance. Gutsy effort. And it made me very happy that he pulled it off, man. Buckley dug deep. It was an excellent win. Joaquin Buckley's got the goods, man, and I'm excited for more. Next fight on the card, main event of the evening. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you all smash the likes. If you're new to the channel, subscribe it up. Derek Lewis, Rodrigo Nascimento. Listen, the fight started slow. Derek Lewis lost the first round. He did land a throw in the first round, but he ultimately got taken down and controlled a bit by Nascimento. Second round, I thought Lewis got it with some big punches, but Nascimento does finish the round on top, and Lewis was getting way too close to Nascimento, but thank God. The power bomb in the third round lays Nascimento down overhand at what? 49 seconds into round number three? 
Big overhand. I mean, the punch landed before that. Follow up, ground and pound. Not Cimento was done. That overhand was like a thudding shot. It's like a baseball bat. And Derek Lewis post fight celebration was epic. Took his pants off, mooned the crowd too. Like you gotta love Derek Lewis. Threw the cup to the media table. The guy from Telemundo had his cup afterwards. That was funny. And he said uh, after the fight, I mean, I don't know. He said he's getting old. He's in his prime, but he feels old. Whatever fighting. I don't know who's next for him, but I do think there's a lot of interesting matchups, a potential Tuivasa rematch, even though Tuivasa's on a terrible slump, potential Rosenstreich fight, which I've always wanted. He sent back Nascimento, the Brazilian taxi driver, as he said. He had to beat a taxi driver, and he did. It was a good performance by Derek Lewis, but I will say it looked eh early on, but that's normally how it is with Derek Lewis. It looks shitty up until he gets the knockout, and then he looks amazing. He climbs back up. I mean, granted, Nascimento wasn't like a top caliber guy, but he fought back somebody who was emerging, was on a nice win streak, hadn't lost, you know, in a long time. 11-1 and one record, lost to Chris Dawkins, a victim of Derek Lewis. But d -Lou did enough to get it done. He gets the knockout. It was a vicious knockout. He moves forward up on the ranks. Not, I mean, not like a jump up the ranks, but retains his spot is really what I'm trying to say. I don't know the next opponent. I'm kind of thinking Rosenstrike maybe. I don't know. That makes a lot of sense. Him and Rosenstrike's a fight that has to happen. He still looks kind of slow on the inside. He, just, he looked like he's smothering his shots. It's Derek Lewis, though. He is who he is. He'll never change. The power is the ultimate difference maker with him, and that's what came to light in this fight right here as he chinned Rodrigo Nascimento in that third round. Good performance by Derek Lewis. I mean, he still got it. He showed some decent clinch grappling. Takedown defense is ass still, but the get-ups are great. He got mounted for a sec, reversed it, was on top of Nascimento a bit. You can't really shame him. Good win for Derek Lewis. A clean knockout. Sends Nascimento back to the unranked and retains his spot up in the uh, you know top 15 of the heavyweight division. As far as the picks for the night, my record was seven wins, five losses. I won with Derek Lewis. It was magnificent. One with Buckley, it was magnificent. One with Ulberg, it was magnificent. Lost with Rebeschke, Ferreira beat him up. One with Woodson, and then lost with Despain, of course. So two losses on the main card. Opposite four wins. Four and two main cards. Split the prelims. Lost, I had Slava, Hooper got him. I had McKinney, Rebovix got him. I had Richie, even though I thought Pennington could have won. Billy Goff I had, he lost. Also, I didn't mention it earlier. That damn knee strike. The illegal knee in the first round landed right to the head. I don't think it was a fight-changing strike per se, but he was definitely buzzed from it. And the ref never jumped in and called a timeout or anything. So the refing was, was bad by that dude. I don't remember his name. Ginger guy. I don't remember his name, though. Ref's got to work on his game. He's not seeing things. He's letting shit go down that can change careers. Unfortunately, the lock dog loses, even though I thought he won. I scored it for him. Charles Johnson, underdog wins. Hardy pulls it off. So what do we got? One, two... Three, four, five, six, seven wins and five losses on the card. Okay, and if Giuseppe would have been on there, it would have been eight and five, and we lost that fight. I'm not too disappointed with that. Seven and five's all right. I got to come better, but at least I finished on a three-fight win streak, and I got the main event pick right and did it right with Buckley. Everybody's underdog, Rizzy Boyev, got exploited by uh, the Savage, bro. Never doubt St. Louis' own. Guys, that was UFC St. Louis. I hope you guys enjoyed the week's worth of content. Dropping full card picks for the next UFC Vegas card. I guess tomorrow, what? Today's May 11th, so May 12th. Keep your eyes on the channel for that one. I appreciate you all tuning in. Much love to each and every one of you. Big W's to everybody. You guys are tremendous. And uh, listen, daily content coming. Let me know what you thought of the content all week, and especially this show in the comments down below, and uh, let me know how you guys did. What was your results for the card? How was your bets? Let us know. I want to hear what the people got to say. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys for 31,400 subs as well, closing in on 32K. Much love, my people, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace out.